The book that I use as a source for that is the same book that I use as a source for tonight's uh, discussion as well. It's called Putting Jesus in His Place by Robert Bowman. It is a wonderful book. I would encourage you to get it as soon as you can. It will help develop more of an appreciation for exactly who Jesus is and what the Bible says about him. It's amazing the stuff that, uh, that Rob Bowman has uh, put together in that book. Um, every year I take a team of Christians out to, uh, to Utah and we do street evangelism. And there was a lady that I had met there who had seen my videos on YouTube. Actually, she came up to David and, uh, and was talking to him about what she had seen on YouTube. And she came specifically to where we were to talk to Christians. And she ended up uh, finding David, who brought her over to me, and she had watched a number of my videos. And she said, I came here just to talk to Christians. And she's raised as a Mormon. And she said, uh, you know, your videos really helped out a lot, but there's three things that I would really like help with. The first one was the Trinity, okay? Mormons have the same difficulty with the Trinity that Jehovah's Witnesses do. The other thing she wanted to know is uh, more about salvation by grace through faith. And the other thing she wanted to know was, is it okay to pray to Jesus? And uh, so we sat down on the curb there for about 45 minutes and went through uh, each of those three topics. Uh, I know for her it was like drinking from a fire hydrant, you know, because we just went from verse to verse to verse to verse. And uh, I hopefully gave her exactly what she was looking for. Um, but this is a topic that I've actually talked with Jehovah's Witnesses about as well. Uh, I have been meeting with a Jehovah's Witness elder for the last year and a half. He actually dumped me. Um, we broke up uh, about a month and a half ago. And prior to him, I had another elder, and we met for 11 months. And we're going through the, the book, uh, What Does the Bible Really Teach? And I can never get through chapter 4. And the reason why is because it's about Jesus, who Jesus is. So, I mean, I spend a year and a half with this guy, and we get stuck in chapter 4 for about half that time. And some of the information that we discussed is, is included in this talk here. Um, but that was something that I tried with him that I'd never tried before, is I like to do things just a little bit differently. I've been accused of thinking outside the box, and frankly, I don't know what kind of box you're talking about. Um, I just look, look at things differently. So that's kind of what we're going to do again tonight, is we're going to look at what the Bible says about talking to Jesus. Um, for me, it's amazing to know that I can address the God of the universe with my prayers and with my petitions, and that he listens to me, and he hears me. And even Jehovah's Witnesses will recognize the fact that Jesus is involved in our prayers as Christians. Now they'll say you don't pray to Jesus, you only pray through Jesus in the name of Jesus, but your prayers go to Jehovah. But we can at least agree with the fact that Jesus is somehow involved in those prayers. Uh, he's, they will admit with us that he is a mediator, okay, for them in a limited sense, for us a mediator in, in, in a much greater sense. So they will admit that, that he is involved in our prayer and that he is a mediator, um, but they're forbidden from directing their prayers directly to Jesus. So the question we're going to address tonight is, does scripture prohibit Christians from addressing Jesus in prayer? Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, we're going to look at what the Watchtower says here. This is October 1st, 2010, page 5. Does the Bible instruct us to pray to Jesus, to Mary, to saints, or to angels? No, only to Jehovah. Consider two reasons why. First, prayer is a form of worship, and the Bible says that worship should go exclusively to Jehovah. Second, the Bible reveals that he bears the title hearer of prayer. Although Jehovah delegates generously, this is a responsibility he has never passed on to anyone. He is the God who promises to hear our prayers personally. So what's the answer to the question? Do we address Jesus? No. Who do we address? Only Jehovah. Now what's interesting is without realizing it, the watchtower has already played their hand. They've already showed us why they believe it's improper to pray to Jesus. Because they say it's a form of worship, right? And worship only goes to... To Jehovah, therefore, we can't pray to Jesus because that would be an admission to his deity. And we can't do that. 
So the only other option they have is we only pray to Jehovah and any passage in the New Testament that seems to direct or address Jesus in prayer, it has to be reinterpreted some way because we, we can't address Jesus because that would mean that he is God. And we, we just can't have that. So they've got to reinterpret that. And, and we've got an example that we're going to look at tonight. Um, but first, I wanted to show you one of the verses that I like to go to, and I usually like to go there first. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. It's really easy to remember, just 1, 2. And, and RNWT, that stands for the Revised New World Translation. It's the transgression that, the, oh, sorry, translation that they came out with in uh, 2013. I like to refer to it as the NWT, the new way to twist it, uh, because that's what they've done with a lot of passages. But some of the time, it's useful. And so as much as I can in this presentation, I've given you verses that come right out of the New World Translation so that you can even show the Jehovah's Witness that, yeah, your translation says the same thing. So this says, to the congregation of God that is in Corinth, to you who have been sanctified in union with Christ Jesus, called to be holy ones, together with all those everywhere who are calling on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Now, as a Christian reading that, I mean, that's just, that's just simple. That's, that's bonehead simple. I mean, anybody can understand that. But they've, because they already have that predisposition against the deity of Christ, they have to reinterpret this. They can't accept this as something else. But what I want to look at is, what, what exactly does Paul say here? Right, it's interesting because it's all, this is almost like a definition of who a Christian is. All right, look at the language here. To the congregation of God, okay, so now we have a context. We're talking about the people of God. Uh, those who are in union, or other translations would say in Christ. Okay, this is synonymous. Congregation of God, those who are in Christ. Holy ones, other translations say saints. All right, so we're talking about the same people. And then he gives this description. Together with everybody, everybody all over, not just the, not just the, the, the congregation in Corinth. But everywhere, those who are calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are all synonymous things. So this is like a definition of what a Christian is. What is the definition? Those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was something that was uh, very plain and very, uh, very popular, if you will, in the first century. That's what defined a Christian. Is in, in the eyes of the world, we've got this new God. And that's why, they, that's why we're called Christians anyway. So, again, it's defining what a Christian is, someone who prays to Jesus as Lord. Now, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord anyway? Uh, we're going to look at some Old Testament background here. It should be on slide four. This is 1 Kings 18.24. The context here is Elijah going up against the 450 prophets of Baal. All right, and Elijah basically challenges them to a duel. He says, let's see whose God shows up. He says, then you must call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of Jehovah. Again, this is the New World Translation. The God who answers by fire will show that he is the true God. To this, all the people answered, what you say is good. Other translations say something like, that's a good idea. Let's do that. I mean, you've got 450 to 1. Right, And sometimes when I'm in Utah, out on the streets talking to the Mormons, it's like that, 450 to 1. But you know what? I like the odds. Because you've got, wh whose side are we on? Right. God's not on my side. I'm on his side. 451, hey, majority plus nothing is God. Right? God's always going to be the majority. So he, he's standing up against these 450 prophets. And he says, you call on the name of, of your God. Did they understand what he meant? Yeah, what did they do? We don't have time to get into the context, but they danced around, they cut themselves, they did all kinds of crazy stuff to try to get the attention to their God. What did Elijah say he was going to do? I'll call on the name of Jehovah. They each understood that phrase meant to address their God, dare I say, in prayer. Regardless of how ridiculous that prayer might have looked, you know, in the eyes of uh, the, the prophets of Baal did some crazy stuff with prayer, but it was still prayer nonetheless. 
Now, here's an interesting thing that I, I never noticed before until I was actually really studying this. He says, the God who answers by fire. Answers. Answers what? Answers the prayer. It's the God who answers prayer. So to call on the name of your God, accepting an answer to your prayer. That's what it means to call on the name of your God, of the Lord. Let's go to another one here. Lamentations 355. I called on your name, O Lord, out of the lowest pit. You've heard my voice. Do not hide your ear from my prayer for relief, from my cry for help. Now, the New World Translation omits the word prayer here, but no Jehovah's Witness would ever argue that this is not a prayer. They're going to admit that, yes, calling on your name, calling on God's name, asking him for help, asking him for deliverance, asking him for salvation, if we're asking him anything, that is a prayer. So they're not going to give you any trouble here. The next verse. This, you guys should be familiar with this one. This is Joel 2.32. Everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. Now, of course, they insert the word Jehovah there. It doesn't appear in the Hebrew texts. Uh, but this is actually quoted in Romans 10 as well. And in Romans 10, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord... And the Greek word there is kurios. It's not Jehovah. Jehovah is a Hebrew uh, transliteration from a German word that was based off of the English, or based off the Latin that came from, I mean, really. It's like a fourth generation word that didn't even exist until 16 something, 14 something. So to call on the name of the Lord is what? It's prayer. Now, of course, we don't have the time to get into Romans 10. Uh, the whole context, though, is talking about Jesus. Even though Paul quotes this, quotes Joel 2, where it is speaking of Jehovah, they do not translate it that way in, or actually, they do translate it as Jehovah in the New World Translation, but they say it's talking about Jehovah himself and not Jesus, when the context is clearly all about Jesus. Um, so now we're going to look at some examples of, of first century Christians praying to Jesus. We've, we've set the backdrop of we know what it means to call on the name of the Lord. All right, we've set that up. That's easy. Um, it's a means, it's equated to prayer, to uh, worship, and our means of salvation, calling on the name of the Lord. All those, uh, those concepts are right there in the same context. This is Acts 1, 21 uh, through 25. I never really thought about this passage until I read through uh, Rob Bowman's book. Therefore, it's necessary that of the men who accompanied us all the time, that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forth two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, Show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry, an apostleship from which Judas has turned aside to go to his, old, his own place. Now think about this for a second. In verse 21, we've got the Lord Jesus is spoken of. All right, So they want to pick someone from all the disciples who had accompanied Jesus that whole time. The Lord Jesus is the context. So if you're speaking of the Lord Jesus, and then you address the Lord in prayer, what's the natural connection there? You're speaking to Jesus. All right? Now, there's, there's more to that. Who chose all of the disciples? Jesus did. Who chose um, Paul? Jesus did. So Jesus chose all of those disciples who became apostles. Doesn't it make sense that he would do the same thing here? Show us, Lord, which one you chose. You chose all of us. You chose the rest of us. And later on in the book of Acts, you're going to choose another guy that we don't necessarily like right now, Paul. But you chose. So that it's a normal, natural function for these men to want to come to Jesus and say, who is the guy that you choose? Because you did this already anyway. Now, Jehovah's Witness isn't going to necessarily buy into this. This isn't something that's going to uh, just totally make your case here. 
But it is something that we call death by a thousand paper cuts. If you get enough evidence lined up, then all these things, they add up. And this is just one of those things. So you've got Luke here writing this, same context, talking about the Lord Jesus, mentioning it, the Lord. Now, if, if, if Luke did not want people to understand that they were praying to uh, Jesus, he wanted them to think that maybe they were praying to the Father, I think that under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he would have worded it a little bit differently. Because in the Greek, those two words are kurios. And if you're going to speak of the kurios Jesus and then address kurios, the context is just telling you that that's, that's who you're addressing, is you're addressing Jesus. Let's go to Acts 7 now, Acts 7, 55. Um, this is something that the Jehovah's Witnesses, this is, this is an example of some of the mental gymnastics that they go through. How, how are they going to handle this passage here? This is the, the, the martyrdom of uh, Stephen. <clears throat> but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they, they cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Now, again, to a Christian... This is obvious who we're talking about here. This is Stephen praying directly to Jesus. What does the watchtower do with this? It should be on slide nine now. Watchtower, January 1st, 2005, page 31. What prompted Stephen to make such an appeal? According to Acts 7, 55 and 56, Stephen, being full of Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and caught sight of God's glory and of Jesus standing at God's right hand. Normally, Stephen would have addressed his requests to Jehovah in the name of Jesus. But seeing the resurrected Jesus in vision, Stephen apparently felt free to appeal to him directly, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen knew that Jesus had been given authority to raise the dead, he therefore asked Jesus to safeguard his spirit, or life force, until the day when Jesus would raise him to a mortal life in the heavens. Okay, there's a lot wrong with this interpretation, and we're not going to look at all of it, but I'm going to give you a couple of little chunks here that you can use. Um, first off, flip back to the previous slide. If you look at verse um, 56, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, what, what was going on here is he was preaching, or, or he was actually being called in front of the Sanhedrin. That happens at the end of, of chapter 6. So he's being called into court to answer the accusations of false witnesses. And he goes into this long sermon that goes all the way through chapter 7. And then here in, in verse 56... He mentions seeing Jesus at the right hand of God. Right? Now, where is he? He's in court. What happens in verse 7? But they cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city. They took him out of the city. Why did they take him out of the city? Because you can't kill him in the city. Let's take him out of the city. We've got more rocks out there. So they stone him. Now, there is no, um, we, we have no idea how much time happened between verse 55 and verse 59. When Stephen says, calls out to the Lord and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So to assume that he's having a vision, that's a bad assumption. Again, it, it could have been a half an hour from the time that he was in Jerusalem to the time that he was taken out of Jerusalem. 
Will I grant them that he was having a vision in Jerusalem? I'm not going to fight over that point. Sure, let's say he was having a vision. But to assume that he was still having the vision after that time of being dragged out of the city and then being stoned, there's nothing in the text to, uh, to, to declare that. You can make that assumption, but again, there's nothing there that says that. There's, there's no reason why we have to believe that. Now, what's, what's, what else, there's a lot of interesting things here that's, that's going on. Uh, verse 59 says that Stephen made an appeal. Okay, it does, in the New World Translation, it doesn't say pray, it says appealed. Um, and they don't say that he, that he called upon. All right, they use something else. Uh, let's see. It's, okay, it says made this appeal. So Stephen made it an appeal. But if you look at the Kingdom Interlander translation, it says that he was saying and called. He called upon and saying. So he's, he's calling on Jesus. Okay, remember, what does that phrase mean? To call on the name of somebody. So he's calling on Jesus. Now, a lot of translations do say that he prayed. Of course, the New World Translation isn't going to say that. Um, but here's one interesting thing. How many of you have the, uh, the Bible app, the, the JW Library Bible app? Show of hands. Okay. Uh, if you are witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses, you need to get this app. It's a big app. It's huge, file size-wise. But you've got to get it. You can get it on Android or Apple, wh whichever device you prefer. If you will go to the reference Bible, or if you don't do apps at all, just grab the big brown Bible that they printed in 1984, and you look at uh, Acts 7.59 in that Bible, or on the reference Bible on the app, and there's a little notation for verse 59 that says, invocation, prayer. So what was, what was he doing? He was calling, okay, in the Greek, he was calling on and saying, or it can also be translated invocation and prayer. And it's, I think it's interesting that they admit that. Of course, now it's buried in 1984, but it's still there, and you can find it. By the way, they've recently added their Kingdom Interlinear translation to their website, jw.org. It wasn't on there prior to this week. Uh, I was doing study on it. I was finishing up some last-minute stuff on Wednesday and noticed, oh, my goodness, here's, here's the whole thing. I mean, it's right there. So the, the Kingdom in Your Linear, call it the kit, they never, never should have printed that book. Because you can see what their English translation mistranslation says, and then you can see what the Greek actually says. So for them to actually include this on their website, it, it's awesome. Use it. Okay, so we on slide 10. This is out of the New American Standard again. Here's another thing. Look at the, the part that I've got bolded in verse 60. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Who else said that? Jesus. You know where Jesus said that? Which gospel? Only one gospel. Only one of the four. Luke. Why is that significant? Who wrote Acts? Amen. Luke. Now, think about this for a second. You've got, you've got Luke writing Acts and writing his gospel. And he's going to use the same phrase for Stephen addressing it to Jesus that Jesus addressed to the Father. Is that problematic in the mind of a Jehovah's Witness? It ought to be. And if it isn't, make sure it is. All right, he said this in Luke 23, 34. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So, same basic thing. Don't hold the sin against them. Um, I love to ask this question. Um, when Jesus committed his spirit to God, was he praying? Yes. So what would be the difference between what Stephen did and what Jesus did? Well, we can't have that because that would mean that Jesus is, is deity, is God. We can't have that. Um, I had a conversation with the last JW elder that I um, met with. He's a pioneer. 
and we were talking about this passage, and of course he's, he's giving me the Watchtower interpretation almost as if he's reading it from their literature. I mean, he, he's very good, had it parroted, I mean, just like Jay was talking earlier, you know, sock puppet kind of thing. He's just giving you the information that he's learned from the Watchtower, because that's all he knows. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, let's say you are being killed for your faith. Who are you going to address to commit to commend your spirit to? And he said, I'm going to pray to Jehovah. And I said, I didn't ask you who you're going to pray to. I asked you who you were going to address. Now, I think it's interesting that you automatically interpreted that to mean prayer. And if you automatically interpret that to mean prayer, why are we going, why are we committing all these mental gymnastics to say that Stephen wasn't doing the same thing that you said you would do? You are commending your spirit to your God. Are you telling me that what Stephen did was wrong? And in, <laughs> I forget exactly how he worded it, but basically it was, <laughs> well, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> Oh, you with all your authority wouldn't have done what this first century, you know, Christian did. One of the early deacons to, to do something, to commend his spirit to Jesus. Why? Because it's problematic in the mind of a Jehovah's Witness. He cannot place himself in the same shoes that Stephen was in when he addressed Jesus in prayer. Um, Rob Bowman in his book on page 49 says the significance of this act invoking Jesus on, is only heightened by the occasion. The heavenly being on whom one calls at the moment of death for spiritual repose is quite simply one's God. Who am I going to commit my spirit to? I'm going to commit my spirit to God. Now, now who did Stephen entrust his spirit to? Jesus. Is that problematic? Even if he wasn't praying, is that problematic? Why? Well, he doesn't have to say he's God. He's just, he's just talking to him in vision. Is that still problematic? First off, I want to know why in the world am I commending my spirit to an angel? Okay, Michael the archangel. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But, um, and they love this verse. Where... Do our spirits go when we die? According to Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then the dust returns to the earth, just as it was, and the spirit returns to the true God who gave it. If Stephen didn't know this, he was a bad student. So we're going to assume he did know this. Stephen, knowing this, knowing that our spirits go to God, why in the world would he commend his spirit to a created angel? It doesn't make sense. He's going to commend his spirit to God. Now, of course, the Watchtower uses this passage to teach that our souls are mortal and all kinds of other junk like that. But why is Stephen doing this? Why is he commending his spirit to Jesus Instead of to God, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense unless you think about it this way. If the, if the spirit returns to the true God and Stephen committed his spirit to Jesus, then who was he saying that Jesus was? He was saying that Jesus is the true God. Now, that we've only got two options here. Either this is a proper thing for Stephen to do or this is improper and he should not have done this. But yet nowhere in Watchtower literature will they condemn Stephen for doing this act. They have a problem. They have not solved this issue. Is this proper? Is this improper? If it's proper, why? If it's improper, what's he doing? He's committing idolatry because he's giving something to Jesus that rightfully belongs to God. He shouldn't be even addressing Jesus. What's, I mean, yeah, you see him in vision, okay? That is no excuse to give to him what only belongs to God. You don't do that. And by the way, there was this little part in the passage that said he was full of the Holy Spirit when he did this. Yeah. So that's kind of like divinely inspired. 
I have been divinely inspired to commend my spirit to a created angel. Does that make sense? No. It is completely against not only what the Watchtower teaches, but it's against what Scripture teaches as well. Yet they haven't come up with an answer that effectively solves this problem. They really don't know what to do with this passage. And again, um, let's, let's go on to the next slide here. This is Acts 9. This is, the context here is, uh, is, is Paul, or Saul, when he, was encount- when he encountered the risen Lord on the, on the road to Damascus. And, and Jesus appears to Ananias and says, hey, you better put your seatbelt on because I got something happening real quick. This dude, he's coming, and you're going to go talk to him. You know, that guy who's been killing all the Christians, you're going to talk to him. And Ananias says, uh, Lord... We've heard from many people about this man and how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he even has authority there from the chief priests to imprison all who call on your name. Context. What did Paul hear Stephen do? Paul was there when Stephen was martyred. He heard Stephen call on the name. Of the Lord Jesus. And here you've got Ananias saying, This guy is sent to kill us. Who's us? All those who call on your name. Verse 19 For several days he, Saul, was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he, be- he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, This man is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and were saying, Is this not the man who in Jerusalem was ravaging those who call on this name? And who had come here to bring them as prisoners to the chief priest? So Paul, he he, he visits Ananias, comes to know the Lord, and he starts preaching in the synagogue. And everybody else who's already heard about him, they don't know what to do with this. Because they know that he was originally coming there to imprison all those who what? Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. So, shortly, what is, what, actually, what happened between uh, him, his, on his road to Damascus and him being in the synagogue preaching Jesus as the Son of God? What did, what did Paul himself do? He explains this, or Luke does, explains this in Acts 22, verses 15 and 16. Uh, Ananias is talking to, to Saul. It says, because you are to be a witness for him to all men, by the way, witness to who? Jesus, Jesus' witnesses, witnesses now for Jesus, I kind of ring a bell. Yeah, not Jehovah's witnesses, Jesus' witnesses. For him to all men, uh, to all men of the things that you have heard. And now, why are you delaying? Rise, get baptized, and wash your sins away by calling on his name. How was Paul saved? Calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, again, this isn't this is some this next point I'm going to bring out was something I learned on my own. I don't get everything from Rob Bowman. Okay, this one I this one yeah I came up with it all by myself. Um, but think about this for a second. How are our sins washed away? Okay. According to the watchtower, how are our sins washed away? What, does, what role does baptism play? It's a dedication, right. And in their mind, it's got something to do with sin, right? Think about this. Does this say... Call on his name and wash away your sins by getting baptized. Or does it say get baptized and wash your sins away by calling on his name? Um, Do you know of any Jehovah's Witness who has ever called on the name of the Lord Jesus to have their sins washed away? No. This is why Stephen was martyred. 
This is why the saints in, in uh, Damascus were afraid of him. And this is what Paul did himself. He came to Jesus, called on the name of the Lord Jesus, and had his sins washed away. No Jehovah's Witness has ever called on the name of the Lord Jesus for anything, much less their salvation. Now, think about this. If, if this is what we do to be saved, then what does that make Jesus? He's our Savior, all right? But Isaiah 43, 11 in the uh, Twisted says, I am Jehovah, and besides me there is no Savior. If he's the only Savior, why, why in the world would he make us all go to Jesus? Why do this? Jesus is Savior, not Jehovah. Jesus is Savior. Why would he do that? If they are two completely separate individual gods, one uppercase God and the other lowercase God, why would the uppercase God point to the lowercase God and say, that is your means of salvation, when in the Old Testament, he has always pointed to himself, the uppercase God, as being Savior? Doesn't make sense to me. Let's go on to the next slide here. This is more examples of uh, Christians addressing Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 and 9. Now, the context here is uh, um, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven and had his vision. One of the things that the Lord gave him to keep him humble was this thorn in the flesh, and we don't really know what that was. I've heard a lot of speculation, but we really don't know what it was. And this is, this is Paul telling us about that. He says, three times I begged the Lord about this, that it would depart from me. Stop. Don't read the next verse. Three times I begged the Lord. From that verse alone, verse 8, we don't know the identity of the Lord, do we? Could be Jesus, because he's often called Lord. Or it could be how Jehovah's Witnesses refer to uh, God as Jehovah. Three times I begged the Lord. It's obviously a prayer. Verse 9. But he, who's he? The Lord. Said to me, my, who's my? The Lord. My undeserved kindness is sufficient for you. For my power, who, wh whose power? The Lord. Is being made perfect in weakness. Now here's Paul's response to that. Most gladly then I will boast about my weakness in order that the power of who? The power of the Christ may remain over me like a tent. So he's asking the Lord to take away this, this thorn. And the Lord says, no, my power is sufficient for you. So then who does Paul give the glory to? I'm going to glorify Christ because his power overcomes my weakness. His power. I am, he, I am strong in my weakness because of his, the Lord's, power. So how many times here did Paul pray to Jesus about this one thing? Three times. He's addressing Jesus in prayer. I think that's pretty powerful, really. Uh, slide 15. 2 Corinthians 16, 22 and 23. Now, this is the New American Standard. It says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Does anybody know what Maranatha means? It's Aramaic for, for come Lord, basically. Okay? And, and that word accursed, that's anathema. That's another Aramaic word. So you've got Paul using two Aramaic words here in the Greek text. One for accursed and the other one for our Lord come. Um, so when I was looking at that, I thought, okay, the, a JW may not really buy into the idea that Maranatha means Lord come, and it might not mean much to them. So I said, well, what's the New World Translation say about this? If anyone has no affection for the Lord, let him be accursed. O oh, our Lord come. May the undeserved kindness of the Lord Jesus be with you. 
Now, I want you to imagine this, okay? I'm sorry, but you guys are going to have to put your JW non-thinking caps on. And we are in a circuit assembly. And the speaker gets up, and he's done something that has never been done in the history of the Watchtower. They predict an end to the world. <laughs> and they give a, a certain date, even. And they say, 2016. April 1st, 2016. Why April 1st? April Fool's Day, you know. April 1st, 2016. And he gets very excited about it. And he says, Armageddon is going to come. Those of us of the anointed, we're going to be, we're, we're going to, we're going to go to heaven. Those of you who survive Armageddon are going to be here forever as gardeners on the planet earth. Doesn't that sound exciting? And then he says, oh Lord Jesus, come. What are you thinking right now? Oh, expletive. Did he just pray to Jesus? Right? Oh, Lord Jesus, come. You've never heard that in a kingdom hall. Nobody would ever make that kind of a declaration. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Yet that was a, first, a common first century prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Uh, and I like the way the New World Translation puts it better than Maranatha, because then i got to explain Maranatha with this. I mean, it's awesome. It's spoken directly to Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Revelation 22.20. 20. Kind of the same thing here. The one who bears witness of these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. What does John say? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Okay, come on down. We're ready. Come, Lord Jesus. Again, this prayer was a common part of, of Christian public worship, expressing the hope of Christ's return and glory. That's what they expected to happen in the first century. It's what we are taught to expect today, that Jesus could come back any time. And, you know, as I was going through this, I, I was convicted. I don't pray this. Lord Jesus, come. I'm tired of this world. I want to go home. But for some reason, he has us here. I don't understand his timing. I'm not going to fight with him about it. But I can still do, I can still follow the biblical example. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Please. Fix this place. Do something with it. Lord Jesus, come. That's what I want. But you'll never hear that in a kingdom hall. But they certainly said it in the first century. Revelation 5.8. This is an interesting one, okay? When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. And each one had a harp and golden bowls that were full of incense. The incense means the prayers of the holy ones. So think about that for a second. You've got these 24 elders, and this was part of the conversation that I had with, with my, my JW friend that I was studying with. I asked him, I said, who's the lamb? Jesus. What do the golden bowls represent? Prayers of the saints. Why are the 24 elders bowing down to Jesus and offering him the prayers of the saints? Why? He didn't have an answer. But that's what they're doing. They've got these bowls full of prayers, and they're falling down before Jesus, which, by the way, is an act of worship. Amen. They're falling down before Jesus. And offering him prayers, and they and it's his response was like, I don't see a problem with this. What's your issue, Keith? Really? I said, Okay, you don't see a problem with this. He says, No, not at all. That's what they do in heaven. I said, Okay, you do it in your kingdom hall. So here's what I want you to do. You being an elder, I'm sure you have the authority to do this. Why don't you just have people write down their prayer requests? All right, just write them down. Whatever, whatever's on their mind, whatever they need help with, just write down your prayer requests. Put it in a bowl. And I want you to walk up in front on the kingdom hall. You and your wife here, because she was there. And I said, I want you guys to just go up there. Okay? 
and fall down, informing everybody that you're going to fall down before Jesus with all these prayers. I says, anybody can I have a problem with that? No. <laughs> Tell you what, you let me know when you're going to do this, and I'll show up. With a video camera, recording your disfellowship, right? Of course, I didn't say that to him. He doesn't know what I know about the Watchtower. If I did, we never would have met for a month or for a year and a half. Um, but, I, you know, just break it down. Put it in a real life scenario. Yeah, that's what they do in heaven. Okay, if we, if we can do that in heaven, why can't we do that here on earth? Go in front of your kingdom hall and say, oh, Lord Jesus, come. Do it. Well, no, our kind of worship is a little more reserved. <laughs> yeah, I bet. All right. Okay, so now what does the watchtower say about addressing Jesus in prayer? We've already looked at one thing. But what else do they say? So watchtower, uh, December 15th, 1994, page 25, aptly titled, Should You Pray to Jesus? Jesus clearly promised his disciples, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Does this require praying to him? No. The asking is addressed to Jehovah God, but in Jesus' name. We petition God that his son, Jesus, apply his great power and authority in our behalf. Anybody having problems with this? When I first came across this, I, I just about jumped out of my skin. All right? And, and I'm going to show you why really, really quickly. Okay? But according to this, who do we petition? Jehovah, not... Jehovah, not Jesus. Okay? And again, they, it, they, they inadvertently admit that the asking, it has to be to Jehovah. Why? Because this is a prayer. They admit that it's a prayer. So if it's a prayer, then it has to be addressed to Jehovah. Because we can't have this being addressed to Jesus because this is a prayer. And prayer is an act of worship. And that would mean that Jesus is, is God. He's deity. He's Jehovah. We can't have this. So who does he address? Jehovah. Not Jesus. So ask this question. Would it be any different if Jesus said, ask me? Would it? I think it would be. Because if they want to go with the interpretation that John chapter 14 is talking about asking the Father, if he said, ask me, then who would the directing go to? It would go to Jesus. All right? This is a picture of their app. And it says, if anything, or on the left, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But on the right... See that part? It's kind of small. You guys can't see it. But underlined there is the word me. That they purposefully withhold from their translation. Why? Because this is addressing Jesus. So, who did Jesus say we could address? Him. If you ask me anything in my name... I will do it. Now, the context of John 14 is the whole idea that Jesus is going to be with the Father. He's leaving. And he's kind of giving parting instructions. And what's this instruction? Ask me. So he's not there for the asking. And, and through my study and, and my conversations that I had with my friend, I realized something about prayer that I never realized before. Even some of the instances in heaven where there is, uh, there's conversation going on between God and other people, those aren't prayers. You know why? Because he's there. The necessary component of prayer is absence. God has to be elsewhere. That's why I pray to him. Otherwise, we just have a conversation. Jesus is not here. Absence. So for me to talk to him, that's got to be with prayer. And he specifically said, ask me. 
So the, the asking is addressed to Jesus. And that's why the New World Translation drops the word me, even though it appears in their kingdom interlinear translation. Now, also, this is another thing I, I, I thought of that I'd never heard anyone else address. This is really awkwardly worded, okay? Let's go back to... Um, actually... Yeah, go back to slide 19 real quick. All right, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And their explanation basically is that we're addressing God. Why? Uh, so that Jesus can apply his great power and authority on our behalf. My question is, since when did Jehovah become the mediator between me and Jesus? Why am I going to God to ask him to get Jesus to do something for me? That's all switched. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. Why do I go to God to get Jesus to do something for me? Shouldn't I go to Jesus to get God to answer my prayer? I mean, he is mediator. This makes God, Jehovah, the mediator between me and Jesus. Because, <laughs> Jehovah, would you talk to your son for me? I need help. Right? What Jehovah's Witness is ever going to do that? No, we only address Jehovah. And whose help am I expecting? Jehovah's. Jesus has already done his stuff, and he's mediated for a group that I'm not part of anyway. I don't really need him for anything. Why? I'm going to live here on paradise earth anyway. I'm never going to see him, never expect to see him, frankly don't want to see him. Why? Because my place is here on earth. So why in the world are these first century Christians taught to go to God to get Jesus to help them for something? No. It's because you go to Jesus. Why? Because I expect to be with him forever. And you know what? I don't care if it's here on heaven or here on earth or there in heaven or anywhere in between. As long as I'm with Jesus, that's what I want. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. I'm not asking for the kingdom to come. I'm asking for Jesus to come. I want Jesus. But speaking of mediators, since we've made the Father a mediator, what does the Bible say about mediators? 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, a man Christ Jesus. So who's our mediator? Jesus. Jesus is the mediator. Now they will admit that Jesus is a mediator. Of course, they're going to only apply that to the anointed, the 144,000, not to everybody else. And now, now think about this. Since the Bible says that Jesus is the mediator between God and men, then what does a mediator do? He's got to listen to both sides, doesn't he? How do you do that if you can't talk to your own mediator? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right. So on one hand, you've got God. And on the other hand, you've got men. And in the middle, you've got the mediator. And the mediator, and I had this conversation with my friend, and I said, the mediator's a go-between, right? He goes between the other, he talks to one, says, okay, this is what this guy says, this is what he wants. You know, it's like you're making a deal. You know, and the other guy says, no, nah, no, nah, you strike this, this, this off the contract and add this, this, and this, then we can talk. And then the mediator goes back to the first party and says, okay, this is what he wants. Okay, but that's what a mediator does. It would be difficult for a mediator to do his job if you don't talk to him. Can't do it. So, again, what's the job of a mediator? Now, they admit this. This is in the awake of March 8th, 1979, page 11. Now, the context here, let me just read it and then I'll give you the context. The mediator listens to both sides and tries to work out an agreement with which they can both, or which they both can live. Now, the context of this article was talking about um, basically staying out of court and using a mediator to come to a settlement instead of having to go to court and having all the expense and frustration and all that. And this is what a mediator does. Mediator listens to both parties and tries to get them to come together at some point. So even though this isn't, the context of this Awake mag magazine is not talking about Jesus, it's still talking about the function of a mediator. 
Now, spiritually, we can apply this to our our situation of having Jesus as our mediator so that we don't face the judgment. Jesus talks to God for me. Jesus appeals my case. And he also comes to me giving me the standards of the other party so that I don't end up being judged. Jesus is that mediator between God and men. He's got to listen to both sides. And he can't listen to us unless we're going to talk to him. So there's got to be communication, otherwise he can't do his job. 1 John 1, 3. This is an interesting one here. And that which we have seen, we have heard, we are reporting also to you, that to you, uh, or or that, that you too may have fellowship with us, and this fellowship of ours is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus. Fellowship. I've got fellowship with the Father and I've got fellowship with the Son. Practically speaking, what does that look like? You'd think. Okay, now the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia, meaning partnership, participation, social intercourse, benefaction, communicate, or communion. The root word of that is koinonia, which means to communicate. The fellowship is to have communication. So, I, I, I ask this question, I do this with both JWs and Mormons, um, but I'll ask them the question. We'll be talking about Jesus, and, and I've heard Jehovah's Witnesses say this. Mormons will say it more, but JWs are starting to pick up on this now too. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses tell me that. They have a personal relationship with Jesus. I said, really? Okay, do you pray to them? Well, No. <laughs> no, we pray to the Father in the name of the Son, in the name of Jesus. We address Jehovah in prayer, but we don't address Jesus in prayer. Okay, so you don't pray to Jesus? No. Would you say you talk to him? What do you mean talk to him? Well, like we were talking right now, do you talk to Jesus? No, I don't. How can you have a personal relationship with someone you don't talk to? Actually, let's take it a step further. How can you have a personal relationship with someone you are forbidden to talk to? Let's talk about fellowship now. I'm forbidden to talk to you. What does that sound like? Sounds like disfellowshipping. Sounds to me like they've disfellowshipped Jesus. Because you can't talk to him. You can't talk to Jesus. Who? Your Savior. Who? Your Lord. Who? The guy you want to come quickly. Oh, what's your face? Come quickly. Hurry up. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about, God. Um, Can you talk to your son for me? That's not the New Testament example. That's not what we're seeing here in Scripture. These people had a personal relationship. They had fellowship with the Father and with the Son. You cannot have fellowship without communication. I dare you to try that with your spouse. I have a wonderful relationship with my wife that I don't speak to. Really. Show me what that looks like. Actually, don't. Please, I don't want to see it. It doesn't make sense. You've got to have communication. Jesus himself says this in Matthew, uh, Matthew 21, or excuse me, Matthew 7, 21 through, um, I don't got 13, I think that's supposed to be a 23. Not everyone saying to me, Lord, Lord, who are they talking to? Jesus, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but, on, but, but only the one doing the will of my Father who is in the heavens will. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And expel demons in your name. And perform many powerful works in your name. And then I will declare to them what? I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now the Bible talks about having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. That's exactly what we've got here. We've got, and, and notice that Jesus never says, you didn't do miracles. You didn't do powerful works. You didn't expel demons. You didn't do any of those things. That wasn't real. He never questions it. He just says what? I don't know you. Who are you? 
Get away from me, you worker of lawlessness. All these miracles are called works of lawlessness. Why? Because they don't know Jesus. That's the bottom line. You've got to know Jesus. And you can't have a personal relationship if you're forbidden to talk to him. Now, I'm not trying to say that you're not a Christian unless you say, dear Jesus, thank you for this food. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there is no pro, there, there's, there's no prohibition to talking to Jesus. Some Christians, especially those who come out of the cults, this is something that it takes a little bit of time to work through because you're addressing someone that you, you used to think his, doesn't deserve to be heard or doesn't deserve to hear your prayers. So it may take some time to work through. But you know what? God works through all that. The Holy Spirit interprets our prayers. You know, sometimes, I mean, I've heard, I've heard Christians thank the Father for dying for their sins. And I can just picture the Holy Spirit going, uh, no, he meant you. <laughs> you know? There's grace there. And we don't have to address Jesus. But... The first century pattern is that they did. So if you want to grow in your faith, I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to pray to Jesus. I would encourage you to come to him. In fact, that's what Jesus said in John 5, John 5, 39 and 40. He says, you search the scriptures because in them you think it's, in, in them you think you have eternal life. And it's these that bear witness of me, yet you're unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Where do we go to get life? Jesus. Who can't I talk to as a Jehovah's Witness? Jesus. How am I going to get life? You've got to come to Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about getting your sins forgiven through Jesus. Calling on your name, having your sins washed away by calling on your name, follow or calling on his name, following the pattern of the first century disciples who called, who were known, that's how they were known, by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. When you do that, God is not going to reject you. This is his pattern. This is what he set up. This is, what he, this is Jehovah's will for your life. That you come to Jesus for salvation. Not an organization. I can't picture what a crucified organization looks like. God didn't send an organization to die for my sins. He sent his son. How do you have a personal relationship with an organization anyway? You can't. <clears throat> Jesus didn't say anything about coming to an organization. He said, come to me. And if I've got to go to somebody else before I can get to Jesus, then that makes two mediators. And he said, there's only one. One mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So what we're going to do now, Eric, if you want to come on up, what we're going to do now is, I guess what Eric is most known for is inviting people to come to Jesus. I'm going to stand out front here, and if somebody wants to come forward and pray, we can do that. Um, but this moment right now, and those of you who are watching on the internet, this is your moment. Amen. This is your moment to come to Christ. If he's been calling on you, don't ignore that call. He wants to forgive your sins, and if you come to him following the New Testament example... He will accept you, and he will forgive you, and he will never forsake you. Amen. So, Eric. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Did a great job on that. Great.